Welcome to You Matter Most Podcast. My name is Jay Goodman. And my name is Zachary Daranowski. We live across the world. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I live down under in Sydney, Australia. We met on Instagram and we vibed instantly. We shared the same mission to destigmatize and normalize mental health. On this podcast, we'll be interviewing individuals who are shattering the stigma of mental health and pushing the culture in the right direction with vulnerability, relatability, and empowerment. We are stoked to start episode four with someone, one of our favorite therapists in the world, Lindsay Fleming. Lindsay is a licensed therapist who has struggled with ADHD, anxiety, and dyslexia her entire life. Lindsay has worked at Lurie Children's Hospital in the inpatient psych unit and currently owns and operates her own private practice. Lindsay also has a community of over 370,000 people on TikTok where she provides evidence-based mental health information. Welcome to the podcast, Lindsay. Hello, thank you guys for having me. And I just have to start off by saying I'm such a huge fan of both of your accounts and even learn stuff and pull stuff from your accounts and send them to my clients. So just know that I appreciate everything you're out here doing. Thank you, Lindsay. We are so honored to have you on today. We have been social media friends for so long. Uh, We consider you one of the most powerful advocates and activists in the mental health space. You have created a community and we're definitely going to touch on this in the podcast you created just an incredible cohesive community on tiktok of people that are down to break the stigma of mental health and you are an lpc a lot of us listening may not know what an lpc is could you walk us through um sort of your journey to becoming an lpc and what that journey may look like for someone that wants to follow in your footsteps Yes, of course. So I was kind of going in blind when I decided to become a therapist. You know, my, both my parents didn't graduate from college. My dad grew up in Ireland and stopped going to school when he was 10. So I really felt like um, I was on my own path and I knew I wanted to work with kids. And funny enough, at first I thought I wanted to be a teacher, but when you're dyslexic, you have a lot of trouble spelling. So I was like, I I convinced myself, like, I can't be a teacher. I'm not going to be able to spell things and I can't help kids. So I was like, what's another way I can do that? Looking back, of course I could have been a teacher and I could have helped a lot of students, but I decided to go this route instead. And I did my undergrad in psychology and it was very research-based, so I didn't love it, but I still pushed through it. I was like, there's something just telling me this is my path. And so once I got to grad school, I was deciding, do I wanna do my doctorate? Do I wanna become a social worker? Do I wanna be a counselor? And the Masters of Counseling Psychology really spoke to me. It's very focused on therapy, where social work is very focused on wraparound services of if they need housing, if they need food, things like that. So I really wanted to dive deep into therapy. And I think part of that, looking back now, I maybe didn't know it at the time, was because I had tried a couple therapists and it just did not work out best for me. So I wanted to be kind of that person for a younger version of me who didn't find the right fit. And so I knew financially I couldn't afford to get my doctorate. So I decided to get my master's. I could always go back. And I chose to become a licensed professional counselor. And I loved my licensure and I loved my experience. I worked, I went to school in downtown Chicago and my program had a Latino mental health concentration and they're very big on culture and racial issues. So I felt like that was really important, especially working in Chicago where there's a lot of diverse Um, people that I'd be seeing. So that's kind of how I made my choice. And I'm really grateful that I went that path. That's amazing. And a fun fact, a lot of my family is actually from Skokie. Um, I don't know how far that is in relation to you. Obviously, I'm far away from that now. But how close is that to you? 10 minutes. Okay. From where I grew up. 10 minutes from from the city. It's a little bit further. But from where I grew up and where my practice is in the suburbs, it's like 10 minutes from here. So that's so funny. Such a small world. And I want to talk about just things that blow your mind. It's like, so when you went to this program for the LPC, Mm -hmm. did you ever expect you to be here where you are right now? And can you kind of just give us that journey from the academics to now where your platform and your your presence um, as a mental health advocate has gone? Yes, I was an anxious little nugget. I never thought that I would be, first of all, 
posting about my own mental health struggles or getting this far in my career at such a young age, it really just, you know, I always say I do things based on what's making me happy and things kind of just fell into place when I took that values instead of gold mentality. So when I was in grad school, I coached and ran a nonprofit competitive cheer team with a board of all males. I was the only female on there because of football too. And that helped me learn how to run a business. That helped me learn the dynamics of middle school girls. So there was a lot of things in my life that people were like, why are you doing that for free? You have all these student loans. But for me, it was like, this is making me happy. This is what I want to do. And it in turn really helped me build an amazing business and practice. And so I had a lot of practice working in different areas. And how I ended up on TikTok was from these cheerleaders. They had signed up for one of my leadership workshops. And then they had said, you know, Lindsay, um, we want you to download TikTok when we were doing like a social media week. And I said, mm -mm, no chance of my downloading TikTok. But when COVID hit, I was like, all these girls, I know they're struggling. How can I help my community and that's how it started was I just wanted to help my own community and one of my videos just blew up and I all of them were texting me like oh my gosh Lindsay you're TikTok famous and you're and they're so sweet like you're helping so many people so that is kind of how I started this journey and now I just sit back and I'm like I still can't fathom the fact that 270,000 or 370,000 people choose to follow me not just view my videos but want to see more yeah, that is incredible. Two things I took from that. Number one, this is something that I really want everyone listening to hear because I see this over and over again. I've interviewed many successful people, uh, especially on my last podcast, Destination Healthcare, and they all say the same thing. And I asked them, how did you find your passion? So many of them say, well, I just started following what made me happy. Even at, at first, maybe the money's not there. Maybe it's something that no one else understands. Maybe it's something that's like, you know, why are you spending your time at this camp or this, you know, you're, you're not making any money from this. What are you doing? If that's making someone happy, the opportunities that will come from that down the road are, are tenfold. So I think that's just really important because a lot of people ask, how did you find your passion? And it's, it's not, a lot of people don't have this epiphany where they woke up one day and said, I'm going to become a psychiatrist. It didn't happen for me. And it doesn't happen for, I don't think it happens for many people. It's the series of small steps of, of finding your happiness. And the second thing I want to say, and kind of leading to my next question is, okay, so you start on TikTok, you, you get a video that goes viral. Now you're 370,000 followers. You built this massive platform. You have your practice, you have a podcast, you got all these things. But what, walk us through those, those initial moments of realizing, oh my God, I'm viral. Did you think it was just like going to be a one and done thing? Oh yeah, I, I had one video that I thought, oh, people really related to that, that's great. And that was gonna be my two seconds of fame and that was good. Um, but what I really saw coming in was the amount of teens who wanted more information. And that's where I think there's sometimes a misconception of, oh, teens don't wanna go to therapy. And what I was seeing was questions, wanting more support, asking me very, basic things that I think could be implemented into schools that could be a simple discussion of like, how do I ask for help? Where do I go? And what I also saw a lot of was what does therapy look like for teens and what are the rules? Because I think a lot of teens are fearful of sharing things in therapy because like, are their parents going to know? So I guess I, you know, when you're enmeshed in a world, you know the ins and outs and I forget that the outside doesn't know. So even just bringing awareness, not to, yes, we need mental health, but what does therapy look like? And what is that experience like? And I think, what does therapy look like? Such a good question. I think what you do with your platform, sure, we talked about you have 370,000 followers, people who click the button, but you developed like a family or a community or a tribe, whatever you want to call it. And can we speak about why you started this in terms of every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. CST, you do a live TikTok session. Can you talk about what that's done for you and your platform? Because I think that's amazing. Yeah. I, I join every once in a while. I'm just like blown away uh, by those conversations. Yeah. You know, I wanted to do, because so I made a rule for myself because in my message, my direct messages, there was a lot of people who are really struggling. And as a licensed therapist, I have to be mindful of what my role is. And social media is not therapy. So, and I know that's confusing, especially for teens and with 
therapy being not discussed often. I wanted to be very clear with boundaries because I think that's super important. So for me, I wanted to model for these teens how what are healthy boundaries so I don't answer answer direct messages but here's what I can do here's a safe space I can give you once a week for an hour where you can ask me questions and I can give general responses and what kind of came from that is one I don't know if you guys are aware of this but one of my lives was lagging I was getting really frustrated with myself because I'm like why is the wi-fi not working you know um and my a lot of my followers started messaging each other while my live was lagging saying let's find each other and so all of a sudden on my videos people are commenting dinosaurs and I'm like is this like a gen z thing that I don't I'm not aware of like what does this mean is this good is this bad like am I getting made fun of I don't know what's happening and so um I asked one of them like in the comments I'm like what does a dinosaur mean like someone help me out and they said that they all had been like we want to connect with each other and what happened was 15 of them created a snapchat group where they support each other and they are from all around the world and they, you know, make videos and they have a fan page of me, but more importantly is they have a safe space that they've created for each other. And that's what I love about my account that other people are finding each other to provide that support that they might not have. Wow. <laughs> that is what it's all about. I can't believe that, that, you know, I can believe it. It's just, it just blows my mind when I, when I hear stuff like that, because we get on social media, we never anticipate what we what we may see a year down the line there's groups of people that know each other and that are friends because of you and you two in particular zach and Lindsay, you two are the best i've ever seen at building communities on social media you've done you've been able to tap into this uh sort of frustration with with culture and stigma uh, there's there are you know we touched on this in, in the voices of hope live that we all did together with Jazz and Genevieve and everyone else, uh, there's a group of people out there, thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, that are just so sick of mental health stigma and that are looking to to make some changes around here. And you two are are some leaders in that field, so uh, incredible. And I want to I want to touch on a, on a point right here. This is something I saw on your on your website, Lindsay. Uh, you had mentioned on your website. And I quote, if you learn anything from me, I hope you learn that when I stopped trying to be perfect and the person I thought I should be, when I began treatment for my anxiety and ADHD, I found who I truly am and my passion for helping others my way, not the way I thought I was supposed to. Could you, could you touch on that and explain that a little bit for us? Yeah. So I think, you know, as a perfectionist, you know, as a firstborn, we see this too with people who have immigrant parents when you're the firstborn, a lot of times there's this pressure of being successful and you naturally have that hard work because you know your parents gave up a lot for you to be where you're at and um with that mixed with anxiety and my dyslexia like i received so much praise going growing up for trying hard right my third grade teacher told my mom i feel bad giving her a b because she tries so hard and although that seems great right we're telling a kid that she works hard we're in, but then it tied my worth to I always have to be perfect and I always have to try hard. And so that becomes overwhelming. And I really was fearful of making mistakes. And I think with the dyslexia, I was always thought I was hiding it. And I had some experiences when I was younger, like a kid said, um, would ask me for help every day in math class. And then one day I wasn't there during the test because I get extra time. And he was like, Lindsay, you missed the test. And I said, no, I get extra time. And he's like, for what? I said, I have a learning disability. Never again ask me for help. Even though I got an A on the math test because dyslexia is about reading, not about math. And so, you know, but those messages seeped into me where I was like, oh my gosh, I can't let anyone see my struggles or they're going to not take me seriously or think that I'm stupid. And so I got these little messages of you have to work really hard and you won't achieve what other people do. And if people know you're struggling, they're going to not trust you anymore. So when you're a therapist and in a position of power and trying to help people, I was so scared that people were going to find out that like, I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing or I'm not good enough. And then I'd have my own worries, like, am I good enough? And so just starting therapy and really working on the perfectionism for me and the anxiety and practicing making mistakes and using my voice. Cause I was always fearful. Like I never wanted to rough up anyone's feathers or people be mad at me. And then I found like I became really empowered by that. And I use empowerment a lot in my sessions too. So I think instead of thinking of, oh my gosh, I have to fix my weaknesses. I 
I just build on my strengths and that has helps me feel comfortable, feel confident and provide better care. I think that's amazing. And, and the fact that you said you didn't want to like ruffle anyone's feathers, this feeling of the vulnerability and wanting to create change and maybe feeling ostracized or isolated. And you spoke on something that I thought was really a powerful word that we didn't touch on, you said happiness, but a value system. Um, how have you really developed your value system as this mental health care professional who speaks from this vulnerable place and hopes to empower people without feeling those feelings that would be inevitable of someone who's successful yet vulnerable? Mm -hmm. Sorry, hold on, my phone is ringing, but there's no one calling me. <laughs> no worries. Like there's like, figure that you out. That? Can you no, hear that? No, we didn't hear that. No? Oh, okay. Sorry. So no you worries, were asking no me about vulnerability, like what, like about, yeah, yeah. just repeat that. I'm sorry. I was distressed. Of course. Of course. So the question was, we were speaking about, mm -hmm. you were saying ruffling your feathers yeah, uh, and yeah. not wanting to upset anyone. And I was speaking about this, you're a mental health care professional who speaks from a vulnerable place. And I just mm -hmm. feel like when you're here, when you're supposed to be here and you're in this one person by yourself and you're isolated or you could be ostracized, how did you develop that value system to not really care what maybe the perceived thoughts of others would be and just follow your own path down this road? Yeah, I, I think when I worked at the hospital, there was a woman on the team who was bullying me and essentially was just did not like me. And, you know, I tried everything to get this woman to like me and she just didn't. And, you know, as someone who has trouble accepting that people wouldn't like me, that was really hard. I was anxious. I didn't want to go to work. And, you know, I tried to talk to my manager about it and she took like approach that just didn't feel helpful to me. And I kept trying just, if I'm nice enough, if I do this enough, then things will change. And it just didn't. And so that was my moment of like, you know what, people are always going to have an issue with me. People aren't, might not like me for their own personal reasons. And I just decided like, this is causing me so much anxiety and it's not helping me in life. And so that moment of working with someone every day and being able to start to use my voice and see that it's okay to use your voice and it's okay if people don't like you, that really like practice. Like, and I always say to my followers, baby steps. So I really took baby steps towards that. And I always, I learned it's harder to set boundaries after and it's easier from the start. So now I'm more able to recognize my own worth and worry about what I'm feeling instead of what other people are feeling. And so, and so that's kind of how I really got to the place of that. I think that experience, which was really hard in the moment, helped me become who I am. And there's been some situations online too, which I don't know if you guys are aware of. There's a video where someone changed the words of my video to say, kill yourself. So it looked like I was saying that to kids. Um, and it got like 5 million views and TikTok didn't take it down and they weren't responsive to me. And so that was also hard because now here in this space that I've created a safe space for my community and this is happening to me. So I think, you know, as I go went about life, instead of thinking, okay, I just need to solve this problem and everything will be perfect. I learned life is the majority in the gray area. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. So why don't I learn better to live in that space? And now I've been so much happier. Wow. I can't, you know, I can imagine because I've also been trolled, mm -hmm. but not on that scale. Uh, that is, must be so hard to see. First off, I commend you on, on the maturity and, and positivity that you show in that situation. I've, I have experienced, so someone had done something similar to me, taken a video of mine and um, where I was discussing uh, different ethnicity. I, I was showing the different uh, salaries of, of, of different uh, ethnicities in, in the United States for, for doctors mm -hmm. and showing that there's a, a, a gap that exists between African-American and Caucasian and Latinx. And I was just showing all of them and someone had, had flipped that and turned it and, and stitched it or whatever to make it appear that I was being racist. And um, I remember it, it caused me so much stress. It caused me uh, you know, maybe it got 500,000 views. Here's a video that got 5 million views. You, your platform is advocating for suicide prevention for mental health. And this is a pro suicide post. I can't imagine what you were going through in that time. And, um, yeah. I commend you for, for, you know, staying positive and mature during that time. Cause that might've broken me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I know I took a break for, and you know, you, I don't know if you guys feel this, but as a creator, like I do feel 
so much pressure to make sure I'm catering to my followers, to my community. And in that moment, they were all having a hard time. Like I was watching them comment being like, if she sees this, she's going to be so upset. Like, how do you think she feels? And they're going back and forth with people in the comments. So then I'm worried about them. And then I'm also like, you know, a therapist. So I have to manage my feelings about work. And so you know, that time frame, I really had to practice what I preach. I took mm-hmm. a break for a few days to figure out my, I was in my feelings. You know, I said, I'm going to be sad for a couple of days and I'm just going to feel my feelings. And I threw myself a big pity party and I really just, you know, gave myself time to process what was happening, how I felt about it and how I wanted to handle it. And I feel like because I gave myself that time, it was super helpful for me and I was able to approach it in a way that I wanted to. Yeah. Thank you for being real and, and sharing mm-hmm. what you were going through there. That brings me to my next question. Uh, I, I've, a lot of people have reached out to me, I'm sure maybe to you as well, and you too, Zach, um, saying something along the lines of, I want to be a blank, but I don't think I can do it because I have blank. So I want to be a doctor, but I don't think I can do it because I have depression. I want to be a therapist, but I don't think I can do it because I have anxiety. And I'm wondering mm-hmm. if you can, you know, you are a therapist that has opened up about having their your own mental health struggles you're here you're doing it um does does one does that give you an advantage um and and two what advice do you have for people that are struggling and think to themselves that they can't become what they want to be because of those Mm -hmm. struggles yeah you know to speak to the advantage piece first i think it gives like a unique perspective but also you know it's a double-edged sword i think the same thing with people who don't experience mental health struggles. I think everybody has experienced at least some anxiety or some sadness or despair. So I think we can connect on that level as human beings. Um, But for me, I have to be, so I can connect and understand what it feels like to have ADHD and be forgetful and all those things and anxiety, Um, but also I have to be mindful. I'm not assuming they're having the same experience as me. So it's never that you can't. I remember my, one of my aha moments of like, okay, I have to be mindful was I, after my first, my internship, my first ever time observing an intake, this client was talking about their anxiety and I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, that seems pretty normal for that age. And when they left my supervisor, I was like, what do you think of the severity of the anxiety? I was like, oh, I didn't think it was that bad. And she was like, what? That was really severe. I'm like, oh my gosh, my scale of anxiety is off because I'm anxious. So it's just about recognizing and being aware and taking care of yourself. So I, you know, talking about anxiety all the time made me anxious. So I went to see a therapist and now I don't need to see them anymore. However, let's if something happens where I'm getting overwhelmed at work or in my personal life, I have that person there to help me. So it's a strength because I can really understand what it feels like to be stuck in that anxious cycle. I know what it feels like to procrastinate work when you really want to be successful and it's blocking you. And I know what it feels like to be super anxious. So I can relate to clients on that note. And I also need to take care of myself and make sure my mental health is in check. And just that looks like taking breaks when I need them. And I never, I know I hear that a lot. I have people, the the person who developed DBT therapy, which is one of my favorite therapies, was, had borderline personality disorder. And she made a therapy that is now one of the best types of therapy for people who are really struggling. And so the idea that you can't be successful is not true. Do you still have to take care of yourself? Yes, but you definitely can still be successful. And I think, so before each session, Jake and I speak and just chat about the upcoming guests. And I think the thing that overlaps you with Victoria, with uh, a lot of mental health advocates is the, just the vulnerable confidence and I think whatever your story is being open and willing to share from it and that vulnerable perspective and also being aware enough to know that although you're experiencing these things that it maybe doesn't overlap to that person's experience but just the ability for you to open up is what creates that safe space that created the snapchat group the dinosaur emojis Mm -hmm. and the hundreds of people (laughs) on your tiktok lives every single week and the adolescence and the gen z brings me to my next question in regards to what is, do you find, maybe you learned this through the TikTok live or through therapy, the biggest mental health hurdle with adolescents in 2020? Mm -hmm. I think education and space. Those would be my two. 
you know, um, I say now people ask me, do you, I think the stigma has been broken. I say, what I see a lot of is your kid can go to therapy, but my kid doesn't need therapy. So I think, and, and culturally too, we have to pay attention. Certain cultures are more open to therapy than others. And um, so to being super mindful of your client and who they are and what their family's beliefs are and that education piece is so dire and so important. And where I get stuck is like, we have gym class. We have gym class for physical education. Why can't we have a mental health class as well? And that's really what I would see being the most impactful because, you know, the, they're coming to me with questions. They're scared to ask questions because they don't know if their parents are going to find out. So they need a safe space to be able to have these questions answered. And they don't know, they know as a teenager, you go through puberty, you already are feeling different things. How are you supposed to know what's clinical and what's norm normative feelings and behaviors? And a lot of kids ask me, how do I ask my parents for therapy? How do I ask for help? So I think as we know that suicide rates from 2000 to 2007 were at a steady decline for 10 to 14 year olds and they tripled from 2007 to 2017. And we know that anxiety has skyrocketed and depression. So we're seeing this and we can see kind of these ages where it's showing up why can't we implement the support and the education? So much preventative work. Okay, come into therapy. What about the, what are so much reactive work? Okay, come into therapy after you're in this bad, this place where you feel stuck. What about the preventative work? What about teaching coping skills so that it is like we, you work out to make your body feel better? The same thing for mental health should be taught, that healthy hygiene. Hundred percent. One of my favorite rappers, Big Sean, has a has a quote in one of his recent songs, something along the lines of, "In school, we learned uh, calculus, chemistry, and biology, but never how to cope with anxiety." And it's so true because when we were in elementary school, you know, I could speak from my experience. We didn't learn any coping mechanisms for mental health. We, I grew up thinking that depression affects maybe like one in a thousand. And, you know, you just, you just get it. And then, you know, maybe it just goes away. I didn't really understand. And this is something I brought up, brought, uh, brought up in the voices of hope is that I see my six or seven year old niece bring home her homework from first grade. And it has a whole section for you know, how do I feel today? Um, being sad is okay. You know, she's writing these things out. I grew up thinking being sad is not okay. You have to be happy all the time. And if you're not happy, you better become happy or don't show anyone that you're sad. But the kids these days have so much more exposure than what we had. They have movies like, um, uh, what's the Disney Channel movie where they see all the emotions, they're in the brain. Uh, Inside Out. Inside Out. Inside yes. Out show ta taught me, you know, I, I knew this at this <laughs> point, but it really, it, it did yeah. instill this belief in me that it's okay to be sad. Sadness is an important emotion to experience. And if you don't experience sadness, that's actually unhealthy. So I, I am so happy and um, hopeful for this new generation with the exposure that they're having. Mm -hmm. And a huge component of that is people like you that are providing them the education and the evidence-based resources to be able to mm -hmm. seek help, seek treatment, and, and um, advocate and educate for themselves to learn, I might be feeling anxiety and here are the following steps I can do um, to help myself feel better. And I don't know if we had those tools when we, were, when we were younger. And another piece too that I think about is, it is a different world. And every, with these streaming services, love them. Like I will binge watch Netflix for five hours, like no problem. However, what I'm learning is kids are scared to tell their parents when they watch scary things and they are not good at regulating what is appropriate for their age. And the expectation of parents to watch every show before their kid does or is aware of what they're watching, it's not there, you know? And we don't talk about that enough too, I think, of like, I've had clients and people in my workshops and just parents come to me where the kids have seen something that really scared them on TikTok, but they don't wanna tell their parents because then they think they're gonna get the app taken away. And so we've created kind of to this with the rise in social media and awareness of like, we have to use it appropriately and be mindful of it. And the same thing with these streaming services, there's also this lack of knowledge of what kids are viewing. And so I wanna give kids at least the education to know like 
you shouldn't be watching Criminal Minds if we're anxious. That's just going to make us more anxious. But I don't think they can, sometimes they can't even recognize that within themselves. Like, oh, this show is impacting my mood. So basic education like that too is super important that I think can be implemented in schools really easily. However, it is hard because you need that licensed therapist or doctor, someone who's educated in this. And you need to have these conversations in a way that really creates a safe discussion not fear tactics and not shaming. Yeah, and I think when you think about it in terms of, so the, you were speaking from 2000 to 2007 that it plateaued and then over the next 10 years, the mental health rates tripled. Um, I think that has a lot to do with social media and the presence of Facebook, Instagram, MySpace, TikTok, whatever you wanna call it. And also like the criminal minds perspective of you can't really gauge what works for you. And I think that brings up, you were speaking about preventative therapies as well. And I started TikTok when I was just trying to journal to myself, hoping that one or two people would connect with. And through that, I learned vulnerability equals relatability equals empowerment. And I'm like, I, I'm so pro like destigmatize and normalize, but I think that market to be quite honest with you already is becoming it's saturated and there's enough of that, but there needs to be more about coping mechanisms, strategies and resource. Okay, we know it's not okay, but how can we mm -hmm. move forward? So my question to you is twofold. One, if you've never experienced mental health, what's like a good way of like segueing to be like, maybe I should seek support? Because if you've or never experienced it before, you don't know you're going down that rabbit hole. A rabbit hole. Um, mm -hmm. And the second thing is, what is like one piece of advice you would give to them once they sought support? Um, yeah. So I think also I can note, you know, you brought up a good point of like, is social media kind of triggering this rise in suicidal um, tendencies? And I, in what the research that I last had looked at, which was from 2017, 2018. So I haven't seen the updated research, but they really broke it down into three categories. So high pressure to succeed as parents get more anxious about the economy or the world, they double down on their beliefs for their kids. So they're like, you need to get good grades and get into a good college. Um, and so that is one thing too. And we also think of high pressure to succeed before you would just compare yourself to your classmates and people you're around. Now we're comparing ourselves to the whole world and to a false world because so many people just put their highlights of their lives on there. The other piece was a world that feels unsafe and unpredictable. And this is before COVID. So I can only imagine what the newest research is going to show us. But that I think is important to note too, when we're talking about political stuff, racial stuff that's going on. Also, a lot of people talking about global warming and the fear of that. We're having kids practicing, and at least in America, um, school shooting drills. Like that does something to kids too. Where's the discussion of what that means to their mental health? And then the social media side too. And the social media side, the research side, like if you use your phone for more than two hours, that's where they're seeing people more likely to self-report issues with mental health. So that's one way you can gauge like how much social media are you using and how is it making you feel? And that's something for a week, try to decrease that to two hours and see if you feel better. When they really looked at it, it's also the more important piece than the amount of time is what you're doing on it. So people who are viewing things like our posts or um, Victoria's posts or things that are really positive or they're, they're friends and creating communities and support, that's great. The people who are watching all of these really thin influencers or stuff that you know can cause those negative self-talk. So it's important to also pay attention to what you're viewing. Um, as far as what we can do preventatively um, and how kids can kind of notice is just having those open discussions, finding someone you can talk to and being making those baby steps of like, you know, I'm feeling anxious. I think it's okay. Like, I think I'm okay. I think it's just like, I can handle it, but just allowing people to be aware. So finding that support system where you can talk to people and say, is this normal? You know, I think the main thing I think of is it's impacting your functioning. If you're having trouble sleeping, if you're having trouble concentrating, if you're having trouble, um, if it's impacting your ability to get your work done. This has been a blast. I'm so happy that you came out today. And I want to ask you just before you go, uh, for everyone that's listening here and thinking, oh my God, I love Lindsay. Where can I find her? Um, where can they find you? And then what's next for you? I, I heard a podcast is, is in the works, uh, maybe a book. Tell us what we can expect and where we can find you. 
Yes. So you can find me at lindsay.fleming, L-P-C. And people often spell my last name wrong. So it's Lindsay Fleming, F-L-E-M-I-N-G, L-P-C. And then same thing on Instagram, Lindsay underscore Fleming, L-P-C. And what's next for me? Yeah, I started a podcast. I think I'm just going to do like a short series of that. So like 10 episodes and that will be my podcast endeavor. And then I don't really know what's on the horizon. I'm trying to focus on my practice and keep providing help for my following and see kind of where that takes me. That's so exciting. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. We're honored to have you. Yes, Thank Lindsay, thanks guys. for being on and we're excited to continue to follow you along your journey. Yes, and I'm so excited to continue to work with you guys. You guys are, you know, just and any listener here, you guys are who you are online and offline. So supportive and so authentic. And I think that's important to know because that's hard to find. And it really helps create support for me on TikTok too, knowing I can always come to you guys if I need to. And what awesome. you guys listening need to know is that we are all repping Mental Health Movement merch. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, y'all. Thanks for coming, Lindsay. Thank Bye, you. Lindsay. Bye, Lindsay. All right. So. Yeah.